We're so grateful to be one body here on campus today and, and so grateful to worship today and hope you're having a real good time over there this morning. Welcome everybody to this second week in our summer series, our summer preaching series. As you know, uh, the topics for this summer series were pro proposed by all of you. Last week, Reverend Elizabeth preached on when bad things happen to good people. I know you're still thinking about, is this this or is it this? Is it a blessing or is it good luck or bad luck? You'll be thinking about that a long time. And if you didn't get to see it, we not only live stream our sermons, but you can also watch any of them recorded. So if you're away during the summer and want to tune in and participate in the whole series, you can do that any week online. This week, our topic is essentially, as Christians, how are we to live? One of you wrote a lovely letter to me and said, you're always talking about how God cares for us and God heals us and God is with us when we lose loved ones and God forgives us when we've messed up. But what does God want us to do in response? Well, I do talk about that from time to time <laughs> in sermons, but we're going to talk about that today. You wanted to know in light of all of that, what does it mean to be faithful? Years ago, one of my colleagues, um, Dr. Um, Martin Kobenhafer, uh, preached the sermon at my installation to ministry up in York, Maine. And her, his sermon was entitled, Love Wearing Work Clothes. So today in this time we have together, as we reflect on Romans 8, I invite you to consider how you may have wandered from the path of love and forgotten your work clothes. And I invite you to join me in prayer that God will restore you and me to the path of love for God's glory and your joy for life. Please pray with me. God, you made us for love and really not much else. That's all you ask us to do. So we ask that you would open our eyes to see and our ears to hear a fresh word about love today. We think we know all about love, all there is to know. And yet, here we are. We pray that you would help us to discern the ways that we could be more truly loving and that if we've been less than loving, that you would forgive us and restore us to the path that we might be faithful to you and to one another in all things. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be an acceptable offering. For you are our rock and our redeemer, O Lord. Amen. Have you ever watched those random street interviews where some guy is holding up a microphone to somebody wandering by, asking questions about things you should have learned in school if you'd been paying attention but mostly didn't? Have you ever seen those? I love them. They're usually pretty funny, demonstrating that quite a few p folks probably couldn't pass the citizen ship test for the United States to become a citizen, given that they don't know the names of all the states or the names of the three branches of government or any other number of common things. There are no few number of folks, for example, that imagine that Jesus was American, even though that he was born in Bethlehem, not Pennsylvania, a long time ago. Even fewer know that Bethlehem is in the middle of the Middle East. Now, no few Americans imagine that Jesus was a Christian, which of course he was not. He was Jewish. The followers of the way of Jesus didn't use the word Christian until a whole generation later when Paul was writing a letter to the people of Antioch recorded in Acts 11, after Jesus' death. Well, this past week it occurred to me that while many imagine Jesus is just like us, only dressed more casually and wearing sandals even to dinner, He's much more like the French. According to a new book, Joie, a Parisian's guide to the good life, there are six ways that French culture differs from our own and is similar to the culture of Jesus. For example, the French find pleasure in just being, strolling down the avenue, observing and reflecting on the world, relishing the sounds and the sights and stopping to talk to neighbors. Jesus' ministry took place almost entirely while he was on a walkabout, talking to people, children, lepers, the woman at the well of Samaria, the blind man, the Pharisees, the scribes. He wasn't speed walking on a morning walk trying to get that in before breakfast. He moved through the world mindfully and prayerfully like the French. The French build connections through food. 
We Americans are the purveyors of fast food, with Chick-fil-A among our favorites. If you roll up to drive through you'll discover a whole bevy of folks are walking around with iPads, and they'll walk up to your car even if you're fourth in line because they don't want you to have to wait too long to get your order. Contrary to this fast food mentality, lingering over food shopping and food sharing has become a fine art, although we do do that here at the farmer's market on Saturday mornings over on the island. Lingering strengthens community and supports well-being, and it was Jesus' way of life. Numerous biblical stories t- talk about Jesus at meals in the home of Peter's mother-in-law, at the home of Mary and Martha and Lazarus, his friends, at the home of Zacchaeus, with friends and family, as well as tax collectors and sinners, and of course, the Last Supper, to name a few. How very French. The French love to bring people together. Social occasions linger. Enhanced meals are considered an intangible cultural heritage of humanity. And Jesus loved spending time with his disciples and his extended circle of care. His followers gathered together for a whole day for the Sermon on the Mount. And then they went home and then they came back the next day and stayed. They didn't record it on their television so that they could uh, watch it in 40 minutes and speed through the commercials. I don't know. Does anybody else do that besides me? The French celebrate music and the art paying professional artists for their creative time. And here at Community Church, we celebrate music and the fine arts because we believe music is the language of God, which is why many of you come, and that the arts reflect the creativity of God who spun this whole gorgeous cosmos into being. You see, the French cultivate a culture of joie, joie de vivre, the joy of life. As Christians, we cultivate the art of love, the art of love that for many has become a lost art, just as for many the joie de vivre is lagging. We're experiencing what some theologians call a bankruptcy of love. Think about that for a minute. Have we become bankrupt in our capacity to love one another? Reading the news feed on your phone, in the local press, or watching our favorite commentators, it becomes extraordinarily clear, doesn't it, that for many of us, love is a lost art that we're going to have to recover if we want to truly enjoy this fabulous and all too brief life for the glory of God. Paul invites us to radically reimagine the art of love as if we didn't think we knew exactly what it was, as if for the first time. Throughout his letters, whether it's Romans here or Corinthians, which we'll be preaching on next Sunday, he invites followers of the way of Jesus to appreciate and care for all humanity in all its varied forms, made possible only by the transformation and renewing of our minds to an entirely different way of life. It's as if we are actually moving to another country, like France or South Africa or Argentina. You see, we're in this world, but we're not of this world. We live in the United States, but we are our own country, our own nation, the nation of the art of love. Does that make sense? We are distinct from the culture around us. We embody the language of God the art of love in all that we are and all that we do. Because you see, speaking of love as the basis and center of Christian living, genuine love becomes a virtue that we have to develop through daily practice and prayer. You don't get good at golf or tennis or anything else by just thinking about it or practicing it once a week or once a month. It's a daily practice, and we get better and better at it, and sometimes we take two steps back, and we have a bad day at it, right? And we're forgiven. The character and nature of love is both vertical and horizontal. This love is both godly and social. Love God and love neighbor. You know the drill. Love the 
Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. Jesus' love commandment couldn't be more simple or clear. It couldn't be more difficult. Easy peasy, I wish. When we're committed to the art of love as a way of life, there are sacrificial actions we take when we'd rather take a, a different, easier road. There are behaviors that are outside the bounds of fidelity to God and violations of the art of love that enraged Jesus. Now, we experience Jesus' anger in Scripture on many occasions, but it is never not once towards the government or the politics of his day. He was not from that realm. His kingdom, it says, is not of this earth. The only thing he ever said about government is give to Caesar what's Caesar and give to God what's God's, which was so clever, so smart of him because, of course, the whole show belongs to God, right? Nothing actually belongs to Caesar. On the other hand, Jesus had a great deal to say about those entrusted to teach and embody the art of love who call themselves people of faith who violate that sacred trust, whether it's priests and clergy or those who are saints of the church. If Jesus were physically alive today, he would call priests and pastors who abuse their privilege by hurting children or by absconding with church funds or by running off with the secretary, that he would call them a brood of vipers whenever we abuse our privilege and authority and cause harm to innocence. Thank God we're forgiven when some of those things take place. But oh my gosh, Jesus would have been ticked off. Jesus held the faithful accountable whenever they broke the law of love by exacting taxes on the poor to line their own pockets or dismiss children as bothersome. Let the little children come to me, for to such as these belongs the realm of God. Or by denigrating minorities and foreigners. Why are you talking to the Samaritans, they said. Jesus got in trouble for refusing to blame, blame the lame and the blind and the bleeding for their illnesses healing them instead at every turn. Jesus had a good deal to say about being judgmental and gossipy and controlling, and selfish or greedy, all these things antithetical to love. Thank God for forgiveness. Knock it off, Jesus said. That's my translation, not the King James. Knock it off. Stop what you're doing. It's killing you and hurting other people. If you're hurting other folks, don't do it. Don't do that anymore. His words were go and sin no more don't do that and we all know what the that is in our life but instead do this what are we to do we're to live as those embodied and skilled in the art of love that's it Paul urges us as followers of Jesus to practice the art of love in four ways number one and we're all pretty good at this much of the time Practice the art of love in your circle of care with your friends, with your family, and with your neighbors that you know. Be devoted to one another with mutual love, the Bible says. Our circle of care is given to us as an apprenticeship so that we can practice the art of love and then be able to extend what we've learned beyond the bounds of those we already know and love. In fact, the Bible says, what good is it if you love only those who love you? Even tax collectors and sinners do that. Number two, and it gets harder as we go. Not so easy peasy from now on. Next, Paul urges his listeners to practice the art of love towards the saints and those in need of hospitality. We're pretty good at that. The saints are all of you those who are um, committed to the community of believers. Romans 12, 13 encourages us to contribute to the needs of the saints, take care of one another, and also not just take care of ourselves, but extend hospitality to the strangers. That's why we have ministries that care for us within the church, like music and the fine arts and preaching and worship, but also ministries of hospitality and care for the vulnerable in the wider community because that's what we're asked to do. The saints are those of the church community that nourish one another. It also requires a sacrifice for us to care for one another. 
beyond caring for our own circle of care for ourselves. That's why when we join the church, any church, not just this one, we vow to share in the care of one another and support the church's benevolences. We tithe to the church, we pledge to the church, and we give generously to the church as an act of love towards the needs of the saints within the church, whether we know them or not. And then also beyond our faith community, our acts of love provide for the well-being of others. Acts of love may lead to personal sacrifice, and what this looks like will be different for all of us. For some, it may mean paying those who serve us more money so they can care for their families. It may mean collaborating to provide affordable housing so that those who work among us can live among us. This church is now working with, with government agencies, other nonprofits, the interfaith community, and individuals to come up with a community plan that will move the needle on our lack of affordable housing so that our teachers and firefighters and laborers, everyone who works here, can live here. That's not the case today. Number three, the circle expands again as acts of love extend to a third group whom we tend to judge, exclude, or ignore. Love your enemies. Oh. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse them. As readers of the Gospels, we remember that Jesus said something almost identical. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who abuse you. Now, if someone is abusing you, it doesn't mean you can be in relationship with them or that you can live with them, but you can have compassion for them for whatever's happened in their life that has made them behave so badly as to cause harm to other people. You can love them in a Christ-like way. To describe what he meant, Jesus pointed to God sending rain on the just and the unjust. God loves all, as Elizabeth quoted last week in her sermon. Number four. Finally, Paul urges us to extend acts of love to all people just in case we've forgotten somebody. The circle of those to whom we relate as Christians in genuine love expands finally to include everybody. One of the most common outcomes of defining a group over and against others in its environment is that insiders receive particular benefits that outsiders do not. For example, and don't shoot me, I'm only the piano player here, theologian Mary Hinkle Shore reflects that frequent flyers are upgraded to business class. Employees of the month get better parking spots. Members get special discounts. The bank charges less money the more money you have. So if you're poor and you have an overdrawn check, it can cost you more than the original check was in the first place. Such distinctions are absent in the ethic that Paul describes. The Christian ethic of Romans 12 results in relationships that are marked by humble, generous love, no matter the character or status of those to whom Christians relate. Love one another for God's sake. That's what this is all about. We're going to hear more about love next week. Love is the basis for all Christian life everywhere we are. When we're in our families, when we're out driving, when we're on the golf course, when we're doing our taxes, when we're out sailing, when we're up to camp, where can we go from God's spirit? It says in Psalm 139, where can we flee from God's presence? The psalmist asks. We're followers of the way of Jesus who practice the art of love wherever we go, whatever we do, whether we're sharing cocktails and dinner with friends or serving meals at the Salvation Army for strangers. As followers of the way of Jesus, we practice the art of love without measuring the cost, offering all that we are, all that we have, all that we do as a holy offering. This is God's vision for our best life, our joie de vivre, the art of loving. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers and sisters, on the basis of God's mercy, present your bodies as a living sacrifice holy and acceptable to God, which is a reasonable act of worship. Do not be conformed to this age, but be transformed by the renewing of the mind so that you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect, and love one another as God has loved you. May it be so. Amen. <laughs>